First off, I want to thank the uh, brave men and women who work behind the wall. I want to thank them on a national level because their job goes on How recognizing. How do they try to turn a guard? Well, prison, uh, correctional officer. Sorry, I apologize. Uh, but correctional officer. Uh, How you guys doing today? It's Anthony Gandhi, host of Tear Talk. You know, guys, I went out to Trenton to meet with Connie Eileen and retired Major Louis Soto, who's now a criminal justice professor out at Rutgers. And we did a show on medical assisted treatment. Now we have touched on this topic before, but this was a way to readdress some certain concerns that we had from the last show. And also actually to touch on some new areas that we haven't touched on before. And it was sponsored by the New Jersey American Correctional Association and specifically with a lot of help from Helena Tomei. Now, the show was amazing. I really enjoyed the dialogue. Guys, when I tell you this was great dialogue, it was a great balanced dialogue between custody and medical. It's dialogue that we're not having. And when I went to go do the editing, there's a lot of static in the background. So, couldn't get rid of the static, unfortunately. I'm not using separate mics. I'm just a, I'm not an expert here. I'm just winging it as I go. So I tried reaching out to Connie and Lewis, and they were willing to give me another interview, and we could do it on Zoom conferencing, but then as I'm listening to what we have already, guys, the dialogue is so on point, and I don't want to lose what we have done, especially because of the hard work. I mean, some of us had to drive almost two hours to get to this location, and then on another note, I just didn't have a heart to delete the videos that we've done, so... What I decided to do was keep the video. Now, guys, bear with me. There's a lot of static in the background. If you feel that it's annoying, I understand. You don't have to listen to it, but I promise you, this dialogue is worth that little static in the background. And I felt you guys, as my loyal viewers, deserved me opening and explaining to you that, yes, we have a static background. I'm asking if you guys can oversee it and listen to that quality dialogue by these two professionals, retired Major Louis Soto and Connie Eileen. Guys, this is the dialogue that creates that middle ground. And it's not something I was so willing to throw out and re-record. So, guys, enjoy. Again, forgive the static background noise, but I promise you guys, the dialogue's on point. How you guys doing today? It's Anthony Ganji, host of Tear Talk. Welcome to another episode of Tear Talk. Guess what, guys? We're going to be finishing our discussion on medication-assisted treatment. We all know Connie Eileen. She's been on our show before, and we actually did an episode together on medication-assisted treatment, right? Yes, we did. Uh, there's that smile. Right? <laughs> I love the smile. My wife, my, my wife loves the smile. Uh, this is actually our first time meeting in person, so thank you for taking the drive all the way down here to do no this. Worries. Uh, I know Corrections is very passionate for you, and uh, it's great to uh, finally meet you in person. So thank you. And we all know he's been on my show before, retired major, and now a criminal justice professor. Can I say the school? Absolutely. At Rutgers, uh, Louis Soto. Louis, thanks for coming on. Oh, man. Absolutely. Thank you. I appreciate it. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to readdress some of the concerns that we touched on before, but I also want to touch on a few new topics, one including transition. So basically, re-entry, and as if... Someone is still on the, the, the program, what they call the program, and how do we continue that uh, once they're released? So when we get back from our sponsors, I'm gonna introduce you again to my lovely guest, and we will go and dive right into the topic of medication assistant treatment. I stand by for our sponsor. that had an intelligence program. I wanted to look at problems different. I wanted to increase my critical thinking abilities. AMU offered those avenues to expand. 
Obtaining your degree as an adult, you're actually paying yourself and investing in yourself. You can't put a dollar on it, it's priceless. It's something that can never be taken away from you. American Military University, learn from the leader. All right, thank you guys for listening to our sponsors. Okay, so guys, again, we're gonna be talking about medication-assisted treatment. My guest is gonna be Connie Eileen. We all know her from the Correction Civilian Training Academy, and we also have Civilian Correction Training Academy. I caught it. Yeah. I caught it, <laughs> and I'm gonna keep it, because I'm not perfect, and it's good to see mistakes once in a while. And, and our retired Major Louis Soto, who is now a criminal justice professor at Rutgers. So real quick, just, just uh, if you don't mind, can you reintroduce yourself to my audience, Connie? Sure, I'm Constantine Eileen, and I'm the founder of the Civilian Corrections Academy and right now I'm so happy to be here so we can talk about methadone maintenance or actually medication assisted treatment in prison um, and yeah it should be fun. Yeah I, I thought we had a great dialogue last time and I thought there was stuff that we could still fill in but guys if you haven't seen it guys we did this February 27th. It was a great dialogue. I will go ahead and post a link to the one we did last time in the description. And we had Russ Hamilton last time. He was a retired sergeant from San Quentin presenting his perspective from the custody side. Now, Russ lives in San Quentin. I'm sorry, San Quentin. No, he doesn't. Russ, Russ is a retired officer from San Quentin. He lives actually in uh, California. So I got someone just as good, uh, retired Major uh, Louis Soto. So, uh, Lou, do you mind introducing yourself to my audience? Absolutely. Um, like you said, I'm a retired major uh, after 25 years of corrections. I grew, grew in the department, and I think that starting at an early age, it allowed me to basically learn as I went along. And I have a training background. I worked at the Correctional uh, Academy as well, and that's going to be one of the aspects and topics that I'll probably bring about training for our staff during this conversation. So. Which is definitely something needed. Absolutely. I, I think as we evolve, I think that, and, and changes are coming into the system, obviously with that evolution is making sure that staff is properly trained. I believe MATs is sort of what's happening now, right? Um, so real quick, Connie, from, from your perspective, what exactly is medication-assisted treatment? Okay, so pretty much, you know, if someone comes in and they have an addiction, what we do is make sure that they are set up with a mental health provider as well as set up with uh, any level of either methadone, suboxone, buprenorphine, vivitrol, subutex, um, and there's one more that I keep forgetting, but um, the, the whole premise of it is helping the either maintaining that inmate on um, medication so that they don't have the feeling or the craving for the opioids, they don't have the impact that you typically would get when you're detoxing there's a there's a couple of positive reasons why they are maintained but that's the purpose of mat would you say introducing to, introducing this to our prison and jails is something relatively new so it's relatively new i mean there's definitely some significant security concerns that can be raised because there is that aspect of it being a thing that other inmates would want to have access to that they may not necessarily have access to because they don't meet the criteria for the actual drug. Right, and when she mentioned safety and security concerns, just in general, before we address it specifically, what would be some of the safety and security concerns? Well, some of them is the, obviously the misuse and the try to uh, uh, get elected or get selected for the program and to use this either Suboxone or Vivitrol or any other drugs um, to get that high that they can easily get while inside or incarcerated. Um, the other aspect is that the ones that are on the program can be preyed upon by other inmates that can say, hey, you're on Suboxone, you're on this, go online and try to sneak it out of there and try to get it to us. So it creates uh, what we call another hostile environment for those inmates that are on it or inmates that are trying to get on it. Right, and I know we talked about MATs are what's there to treat withdrawals, correct? Yes. What, what are some of the symptoms of withdrawal? So you'd see fever, you can see chills, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, I mean, you name it. It's, they're, they're almost like flu-like symptoms, but on steroids, kind of. And you know what's funny, I don't know if, from a custody perspective, you may agree with this, but when we were talking about this on the last show, and I was talking to Russ, when she was going over the withdrawal symptoms, and she was especially mentioning diarrhea and vomit, <laughs> right. actually I was thinking, well, maybe Suboxone's not a bad idea, because obviously that helps them through the uh, withdrawal. So I mean, from that perspective, and again, we'll touch on the other security concerns later, but 
you know, treating the uh, withdrawal symptoms could lessen you know, an officer or, or just staff members in general dealing with the, I guess, bodily fluid. I mean, uh, I mean it, it's not just that, it's bodily fluid, but it's also some physical altercation. I mean, the, the individual withdrawing is, is, is pleading or his body is begging, his or her body is begging for something that it desires and it doesn't have. And there could be some physical implications of it. Um, there's some reservations on the correction side on our on our officers and sergeants and lieutenants and captains, majors, whatever, because of, I think there's two separate aspects of it. You have a person that just gets arrested, goes to jail. Obviously, you're picking them up off the street. They may have more severe withdrawals than someone who's been sentenced in a jail setting and now is going to a prison setting with a sentence of 5, 10, 15, 20 years. That individual probably is past the withdrawal symptoms. So the question is, why would we put them on a program now that they've gone through the withdrawal system, system while they're in jail and now they're going to the prison system? So that's something that my staff would have reservations on, and that's their question. Well, I think it really is establishing a criteria. I know different facilities have a criteria that can be established to say, well, this is the criteria we'll use in order to induct someone into the program. Now, personally, I don't see if someone has already gone through withdrawal and they're stable, why you would induct them into the program. In general, what we've, what I've seen is people get inducted into the program who've come in and they haven't gone through all the withdrawal, but to help them really safely either maintain until they get out. So like if you know this person hasn't been sentenced and they're going back and forth to court, their next court date they could go home. You don't necessarily want to detox them and then they go out and the crave is so much greater than what it was before having now been maintained that they go out and they end up overdosing. So I, I think it's really being certain what criteria is being used in order to get them into a program as opposed to just someone's already detoxing and you just start them on it. I don't really know the science behind it. There may be some reason why they would want to do it that way, but I don't really, I've not seen it practiced that way. Who, who would be involved in the decisions to put somebody on um, MAT? So usually the medical director, usually the, if they have a director of like psychiatric services, usually go at that level um, of decision making. Certainly, like the wardens or commissioners, like custody folks, would be part of that discussion as well, because the safety and security concerns have to be at the forefront. But then you are going to have that mental and mental health support that's going to say, well, here's what the research says. Here's why this is important or why it works and how it helps us to maintain individuals. I know there's been a lot of research that says if you put someone on, supposedly it changes their behavior while they are inside and you have less tickets and you have less inter negative interactions with custody. I don't know that to be factual. Um, and honestly, it was it's research, right? And so when people want a statement to be made, the research data can be interpreted whichever way. Bias. <laughs> they <would> Confirmation like. <laughs> bias. <laughs> you know, so it, it, I, I want to, you know, I'm trying to be politically correct in that statement. But, but the but. fact that you bring it up is great because, as I said, guys, even though we may have two views, they represent two different perspectives, but the dialogue here is an effort to bring that perspective to the middle. So you actually uh, said something I'm sure that you're going to want to feed off of real quick, mm -hmm. correct? What, I'm, what I was... Once you put someone in that program, you're saying that they have some criteria they have to meet in order to get there. We know that it is this a tool. It's a tool that obviously has to be used correctly and in conjunction with some other tool that helps out. Um, if we're going to treat this like we're treating a disease, obviously a doctor is going to treat you for several things at the same time. Yeah. What I found out is that um, if I am my severity index shows that I am addicted to either heroin or cocaine or it's just uh, some other drug, that it's not treated the same way. It's not just Suboxone, it's not just Methadone. It's, and those are the go-tos out in the street. Mm -hmm. So when we come into a prison setting or a jail setting, it's a little different because to me, having the MA population know, hey, there's something available now, um, and as long as you meet this criteria, um, they're very intuitive. They know what they, they go back and they talk. Look, all you have to tell the psych is this, or you have to tell the medical doctor this, or you have to tell the uh, practitioner this, that you you are easily access to in-house drugs, um, that there's still, because we know we can't stop all the drugs coming into the system, but 
there's still access, some access. But they do have to be tested. Right? Absolutely. So like they do go through a urine analysis to see whether or not any of those drugs actually pop up. Are in the and, system. And if they're not in the system, then you could come and tell us anything you want. Mm -hmm. But this is what a way that they kind of verify that what this person is saying is actually true. Now, can, can I, you actually touched on something, and this is actually something we didn't discuss in our last dialogue. Obviously, custody is going to make it work. I mean, that's just what they do, as long as they're involved. Mm -hmm. And I like the fact that you mentioned that custody should be involved mm -hmm. in the planning of when they're deciding to put somebody on treatment. Mm -hmm. And I believe that may also take into account the inmate themselves. Yeah. We know these inmates. Yeah. You know, is this inmate looking to manipulate? But what about if there's a conflict between um, uh, the psych and medical? In, in putting the person onto Suboxone, how would you resolve that? So usually we have these interdisciplinary team meetings where you come up and say, well, what is the best course of action, right? The psych could present their case, medical will present their case. If there are other, say, comorbidities that may exist, which you referenced, like, they have to take that into account. And so it may not be the best thing, even if the psych is saying so, because here are all these other medical issues that might be a contraindication to methadone or suboxone or anything else that could treat. So we try to find the best course of treatment, and really it's a negotiation, you know? Well, and, and real quick, I don't think we mentioned the psych's perspective in this, so... Mm -hmm. I know last time we touched on it too, but there is a, would it be a behavior analysis of the individual before they're put on or some type of uh, therapy that they have also have to utilize yes, when they're so, on this program? So in true methadone maintenance programs, the expectation is not only that you get the, medi the medication side of things, but that you're also in treatment. The expectation is that you're seeing a psychiatrist or you're seeing the social worker, you're going to groups, you're finding other ways to cope with these addictions, you're finding other ways to be self-sufficient as opposed to your dependency on the drug. I wanted to ask also, um, as far as getting them on the program, once they're on the program or whatever medication they're going to be using to help them or assist them, are they taught the implications of now you're on this type of drug and God forbid you go out there and try to use something else mm -hmm. on top of the drug that you're on and the what can happen because yeah. we've seen some overdoses about that. So education is part of the process as well. You educate them about what are all the contraindications, what are the things that happen to you when you aren't compliant with treatment, what are the things that happen to you when you start throwing other things in the mix, right? So you know that ultimately this drug is not going to be as effective, it's not going to do the things it's intended to do if in fact you continue to throw other substances in the mix of that. So what do we do with someone that is prescribed Suboxone? They're coming and they're getting on that medication line at a particular time during the day. They're taking the Suboxone. We have, and, and I'll ask you about that. On, that's our side. On the security side, we have some security aspects that we need to touch upon as far as how it's distributed. How do we know that they're actually ingesting it and not giving it back or taking it somewhat to the tier and then dispersing or selling it. But once you're on it and you're administered the Suboxone, and is it is there likely a higher likelihood that they can overdose because they're on that MAT if they took another drug? Because now it's it's been our practice that overdosing is an issue, such an issue that now we try to carry naloxone on our person so that we can hopefully administer that. God forbid there's an overdose. Yeah. yeah so I mean, I think of course anything in excess could lead to an overdose. And so I would be remiss to say that they can't overdose. I feel that once that they are in treatment and they begin to throw other things into the mix, anything is possible. Mm -hmm. I, would, I would just say that when you're in the midst of treatment, you have someone closely monitoring you, so maybe they might be less of, I guess, a threat of overdose, but you never know what happens when they go back to the unit. Mm -hmm. You know, I did have the experience of an inmate being able to like get discarded discarded meds and like was just bringing it back to the unit and stashing it behind like the toilet and like giving them out like they were Skittles, right? Mm -hmm. Like we had, she, she didn't know what she was doing, like mm -hmm. what meds she was given and people, they were just taking them, which I think is crazy, right. but it's kind of what happens, you know, they're not thinking straight, but then you think, so someone who was being maintained, suppose they got a hold of some of these random medications that this inmate had. Anything could have happened.
And you know, actually, since we're going back, uh, we're kind of talking into misuse, yeah. correct? And by the way, guys, I'm honored to have people with like you guys on my, my show. I mean, no one is having these discussions, the effort that we're trying to get to understand each other, because obviously, and I think you both agree, this is what's happening in our facilities, so there has to be a partnership between medical and custody to make it happen, right? Absolutely. And would you say, and we're gonna to touch on misuse, but before we go into it specifically, I wanna ask you a question. Do you think that custody is the fail safe if an inmate is misusing it in regards to, let's say, stockpiling it, or black, uh, we were talking about the black market last time. Can mm-hmm. we go into that a little bit? Well, that in, inherently, in a prison setting, there's always going to be a black market, as you can say, uh, where any type of drugs can be misused, sold, uh, looked for. Um, but on the medical side, where we we're, we can be the self fail safe because as they're having procedures and policies on how to administer whatever the, the MAT drug may be. Um, it could be the 30-day shot, it could be the Suboxone that is taken you know, daily or you know, every other week, uh, depending on the dose. What we see as, as an issue sometimes is that we're trying to make sure that they're not keeping these uh, MAT drugs on their person. So we have keep on persons medications. Mm-hmm. And we've seen that fail when we're giving the person we're trying to help here, here's your five-day dose, or whatever it may be, whether it be a pill, whether it be a Suboxone strip, or something like that. And I think that we've been moving away from that and more administering on a daily basis or a weekly basis or a shot, because that way there's less misuse, right? There's less of the risk of them going back and trying to disperse this to other inmates. Um, so yeah, we're just fail safe as long as we're all inclusive and we're all working together. You know, they're administering, we're monitoring, um, we know that your analysis are usually done by the security aspect of, of the institution, so we have to work hand in hand, those results. I mean, I would also ask, is it just through your analysis that we do blood work to see if the levels are correct when they are taking these MATs? So we don't do blood work. Mm-hmm. That I know we don't do. Um, I think that there's, depending on, so there, I know there are some interactions with some of the MAT meds and with some of the... Um, psychiatric meds. Okay. And so I think there are different blood tests that have to be done if we know that they're on these particular meds, but it's not a part of like everyone's process. Mm-hmm. Um, one thing I wanted to touch on was the keep on person meds. Mm-hmm. Typically narcotics are not keep on person. And so even if someone is taking any MAT med, like it shouldn't be any of these that we're talking about specifically. Um, I know that there have been some challenges with the keep on person meds, and not to say that the implications aren't any more significant, but certainly when it comes to the MAT medication, if they are keep on person, I, that's like an awful practice. Correct. Wherever, if that's yeah, happening yeah, anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> like, let me ask a question, because what about when an inmate voids a urine and um, it shows up positive, let's say, for Suboxone, mm-hmm. right? Uh, how do we know, or how would custody know, or court line know that the person's on the program? Is there a violation of HIPAA there, or? So I don't think there's a violation. If there's a question about, so we've had that happen where someone had tested positive for something which we weren't prescribing it to them. So typically the question will come into medical, we'll check their med list to see like what are all the meds this person is on. And while we know there's some meds that may show up as something that is similar, um, we can typically say like, no, that's not being prescribed. That's not a violation. You know, if I say, well, here's all the meds they're on, that's a different discussion. But if you say, hey, you know, this, this person's urine popped for this thing, then I have an obligation to go and check that person's list and be like, okay, well, we're not prescribing that. Then you guys take take the ball and do whatever. Right, and, and then when we discuss misuse, again, I want to go back to misuse real quick. What are some of the signs that frontline staff can look for if uh, someone's misusing what you're prescribing them, like Suboxone in the world? So if they don't come to the med line every day, that's usually like red flag automatically because if you really need it then you'll be there for it Mm -hmm. right i mean yes it's different if you've got a legal visit you know you're in school or something like that 
But those are things we know up front. So someone in school is usually getting their meds early in the morning. Like there's an extra effort to make made to medicate that person. Um, if you, you know, you're at the barbershop or, you know, in the, in the library, like those are times where, you know, medical will contact the unit to find out like, oh, so-and-so didn't show up for their meds. Like where's that person supposed to be at now? Oh, he's at school. Okay, then you call the school and you make arrangements for the person to get over and get their meds. But when it's just kind of you just didn't show up, like, okay, are you sick? Because that's the first question. Is this person sick? Have you seen him out or her out of the cell? And if you haven't, then, you know, we go in and we do a check. But if you have and you just opted out of meds, that's a different discussion. And from the mental health perspective, we typically make sure that that person meets with their psychiatrist or their psychologist and from that point, you assess, is the medication appropriate for them? And, and honestly, you have to do the reassessment because over a period of time, things do change. Well, n now this actually uh, definitely emphasizes the importance of communication between um, medical, because they need to make sure those inmates show up there, and custody in regards to they have to get those inmates there. Mm -hmm. So um, in, in regards to communication, what would you need from medical? What would frontline expect from medical in order to make sure this communication you know, well, happening. Once again, like I said before, I'm coming from a training background. The adverse reaction to my staff saying, no, I don't think this is a good program is because they may not know what the better benefits are. Um, and we always say, well, let's get medical in and train our correctional staff as to the benefits, why we put someone on this. I mean, we're all going towards the same goal. Rehabilitation is part of that goal. So if we train our staff by saying, he, this is what the consequences to be if the person is going through some sort of detox or going through, I mean, they're not ever going to um, get better if we don't do something about it. And we know the recidivism rates continue to rise if we're not helping them to, to succeed once they're, they're out of the, the institution. But my correctional staff making the, the frontline observations of what are they going through? Because again, if you're not taking the medication, as prescribed, then something else you're taking to keep you level, as, as they said. So they may be going back to getting the illegal drugs, or they're going through detox, which in case, again, the frontline staff is going to observe that particular resident not coming to eat or staying in bed or whatever the, their physical signs are, that has to be conveyed to the medical department. But the other thing is that I found out through training in the years that I've done it, that our correctional staff Whenever we put someone from medical in front of them to teach them, right, about the benefits of a particular program, they kind of like, well, okay, that's good, but how does it help me? How does it help me do my job? So what I found is that having medical teach part of it in conjunction with some con custody and usually the higher rank telling them, listen, this is why. Why we have this program, why we put on an MAT, because it's going to help the whole population at the end is going to help the individual get better. So that's what I see that the communication has to be there, but the conjunction of training our staff to the benefits of it is what's going to break mm -hmm. that uh, animosity, I would say. And I think most people that work on the front line, most of staff realize there is going to be that inherent risk in what we do. It's, it's always. Gonna, it always is. So again, this is where the question be kind, of, kind of comes tough, but do you believe that MATs can make a safer environment for those that work in corrections, and, and does that safety outweigh the risk of that black market? So, the policies that are in place when they're for the administration of these MATs, that's what actually helps in making those risks lower and lower. Because let's say a suboxone strip, right? We know that's uh, placed in their mouth, right? And as soon as it's placed in their mouth, it looks like a Listerine strip. Strip, it starts dissolving right away. So making sure that the policy states that once it's administered, the person has to sit there for a period of time and we're checking in their mouth. This is the conjunction, right? The medical staff will look in their mouth, the custody or the correction also will look before they leave to make sure that there's, it's totally dissolved. Having them drink copious amounts of water before they leave, all of that will help reduce the risk of this person going back and you know taking it out of their mouth later, splitting it up and trying to sell it. Well, when we talk about that real quick, the process of the monitoring them once they're taking it, how much would you say is on medical and how much would you say is on custody in regards to making sure that monitoring is being done correctly? So let's say inmates are bringing it back. 
Uh, we have to obviously address both parties, but I would think the failsafe would really be on, and this guy's, I hope you guys don't get mad about this, but custody, mm -hmm. because they are involved in that. I'm going to say it's a search act, actually, looking into their mouth and making right. sure it's being taken. So where would you, as a custody supervisor, where would you, how would you try to address that? Well, the, the way we address it is the only way we know how. It's by putting post orders in place, policies right, in right. place, that our supervisors must, you know, enforce. But when we say... But are those policies in partnership with medical's policies? Well, medical has a, their own policies as well. So I'm not going to say it's their responsibility to check, it's our responsibility to check. It's both our responsibilities. You see what I'm saying? And that's where sometimes the animosity comes in because we're like, no, that's medical's job. Oh, no, that's custody's job. No, it's our job. Right? So at the end of it all, if you want the program to work, it has to be, there has to be a buy-in. That's what I'm looking forward to say to you. There has to be a buy-in on both aspects. So yes, we need the training for the participant of the program, the inmate, but you also need the training for the staff that are going to do this day to day. You know, one of the concerns I think that frontline custody has, I guess, you know, again, people in partnership with helping monitor and making sure that people aren't violating the program is, I believe a lot of people feel that there is no end date. They feel that there's a start date, but there's really no uh, effort to have the inmate complete. And we mentioned this on the last the last time we did this, and I want to kind of revisit that again because I believe that you had some concerns with establishing a start and end date, right? Yes. I mean, we're, we're talking about um, helping someone, and it's a course of treatment, um, but the line staff was always, always in the back of their mind, okay, so you're going to start someone on this type of treatment, does it have a component where you're evaluating? Is it working? Is it not working? Um, am I? And we talked about it earlier. Are we going to have uh, access to that information? You know, what's it? What does it do to the person? When does it start the program? When does the program end? I mean, those are the questions that are in the back of our minds as we do day-to-day -day routines. Right, and then you also added something before before Connie answered that. We talked about uh, signs to kind of show us that someone's misusing. But then you were quick to remind us, what about signs to show us that they're doing it correctly? Right. So, I mean, we're always in, in, in kind of questioning what information can I know, what information am I not allowed to know because it's a medical treatment and stuff like that. But my line staff um, will always eventually figure out the, the MAT line may be a different time than the regular medication line. Um, you know, just like in some places they may have... Uh, just a med call at night and it's usually a Tylenol line so everybody knows it's a Tylenol line we don't call it that we call it you know uh, med line or whatever PM line um, but the staff will probably eventually know this particular person is on the MAT program um, what signs am I supposed to be looking for it, 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 that I, that'll tell me hey the program is working you know this individual is progressing um, when does it start when does it end um, are they ever going to wean themselves off of this, or, or is there an end date? What happens if they relapse? Uh, or yes, yeah, so we got actually uh, we got actually a few concerns. So before we touch on to the relapse, I, w I was wondering if we could touch on the the developing a start and end date, and also the how the staff know that what's being prescribed is working for the inmate. All right. So as far as a start date, the ideal in an ideal world. When an inmate first comes into the system, they get evaluated, they have the medical assessment done, and that would be the point at which it's determined that this person would be eligible or met the criteria for this. I think the other factor is also, one, is that person like a pretrial person or is that person already sentenced? If they're already sentenced, there might be one path that you take, but if they're pretrial and could possibly be released at their next court date, you may want to make sure you're maintaining that person safely so that once they get out, they're pretty much as stable as they possibly can in the time that they're in our custody. I think the real challenge comes when you have someone who's continuing to go back and forth to court, right? You don't know when when they're going to be sentenced. You don't know what that outcome is going to be. And so you're maintaining them almost indefinitely until there is some end to the, or some resolution to their court case. Um, for those who are already sentenced, you know, what I've seen is that you, they're started on the program because they, we've already secured medical records from their previous community-based organization that was treating them. 
here's what the dosage was, this is what the person is. The psychiatrist, the medical doctor, they come together, they make a decision of the best course of treatment or action for that person, and then they would come up with what the appropriate end date would be based on how long this person has been an addict. I mean, they also take into account like height, weight, all these other things, and what are the impact the dose that they're given is going to have on the actual person themselves. Um, so there, there isn't a clear answer, this takes six months, and I think that custody is expecting that we have like a clear if we start them now this is when they end you know we this person gets treatment for one year right you come in on MAT we're gonna treat you for this much time and unfortunately from the treatment process it just doesn't work that way it does go by what are the signs and symptoms how do we see this person developing what do we see that's not happening do we need to increase the dosage do we need to decrease it and those are things that i think happen along the way through the course of treatment so i think what also becomes challenging is that medical doesn't report that out right that isn't information that medical is going to come to custody and say hey by the way the treatment is working for these folks and this is where we are right like that's just not how it works um, can we create some sort of communication mechanism I think it's a possibility without saying here are all the meds this person's on but we can say these folks were inducted these days these people are still stable these people remain uh, you know we, we continue to evaluate these folks I mean, I think there is a way to provide information so that there is that balanced picture of what's actually happening. But I think there's also the mindset that we have to address, which is there are many people in medical who are going to think, why do you even need to know, right? Why do I need to tell you what's happening? All I need you to do is bring this inmate to medical at two o'clock every day. And that's like all, that's my obligation to you. But I feel in order for everyone to have buy-in to this process, that is really a hot topic, that there's so much controversy around it, that right now there should be open dialogue about what exactly is happening, how they're being treated, what are the impacts of the treatment. Because I think the other side to that is, once the inmate goes back to the housing unit, medical has no idea what's happening with the inmate. Right? We don't know that you, you see that this inmate is not functioning well or that this inmate hasn't eaten. Like We won't see that. So I think the medical side is missing out on the, the other side of the picture as well as you guys missing out on what's the treatment? How is it working? Like I think that's really a two-way thing that there is no start, no end date, which is something more definitive and concrete that you guys would like. But I think this also that we're not sharing information up front and we're also not getting information on the back end. So, so understanding is what's the main priority here. You know, my line staff will not understand that this is a necessary, uh, if you can say a necessary evil, right, in order for a treatment plan to be implemented and help the individual, right, and that's part of our goal. Um, my line staff should probably be trained, right? Trained in exactly that, that there's some information that can be given out, there's some information that cannot be given out, but that this is what the MAT, something new into the correctional system, something new into the prison system, jail system, you know, when they first come in, we give them training, that should be part of it. That should be entirely uh, its own little block of instruction where this is what we do and why we do it, and how we can help medical, you know, implement this even better. And obviously, we, we touched on that before with the communication. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that deals with actually, how do we know it's working? Exactly. So we actually just covered that, exactly. um, which is great. And then there's and something else I was thinking of, I, I took a note here when you were discussing. How do we know someone, uh, or can someone be disqualified from the program, uh, whether during the program, because they misused, or, trying to get into the program so you can actually get disqualified from the program so for example um, anyone who misses three doses right now this is the process that I'm aware of if you miss three doses you automatically they automatically stop and then you have to see the psychiatrist to be reassessed 
and they make sure that one medically there aren't any signs and symptoms that they're just missing or are we jumping to conclusions let's do a thorough exam or assessment of this person before we completely take them off but if you don't show up for three days that's already a, i mean you miss one dose of mat that's already a red flag but three days is the point at which it will be stopped and then you are almost forced into a, I don't want to say forced, because you still have the option to say you don't want to talk to the psychiatrist, right? But then you also understand that there will be no more methadone for you. So it's not like you can have one without the other. Right, now that's for those that are already involved in the program, correct? Yes. So what about if someone's trying to get in the program and can, I mean, is this something that we automatically provide to somebody? No. Okay, no. so what would disqualify them? So, so I mean, I think it's nothing new that inmates are doctor shopping, right? Like they, 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 they'll write out and say, oh, Miss Connie, this, this doctor don't know what they're doing, blah, 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 blah. Then I'll meet with the doctor and figure out what's going on. Oh, he was asking me to prescribe him, you know, Tylenol with codeine or asking me for this thing. And I'm like, oh, okay, so that's what's happening. Then they'll jump to the next doctor. So they'll write for sick call. They might want to ask to see a specific doctor. We don't do that. Like, you can't just ask for, you know, let me, let me see Connie today. It doesn't work that way. Um, and so when they're in that process, that's already a red flag that someone's trying to get into a program that they clearly don't meet the criteria for, else they would have been flagged in a, in a, in a more appropriate way, right. which is we do a review of all the intakes. We look at where everyone, where, where like everyone comes in and look to see like, okay, here are the things that were um, flagged when they did the urine analysis. Certain parts of the intake process are automatic. So once you come in, you have the analysis done, you're automatically set up with medical if you're diabetic or if you're hypertensive or if you come in on certain meds. You're automatically set up with a psychiatrist if you come in and hear all the psychotropic meds you're already taking. So if you didn't pop one of those ways, that's an official way for you to show up in medical, and all of a sudden you're asking to be a part of it, yeah, that's already questionable. And now you mentioned concerns about relapsing, right? Yeah, because if a person is in the program, an MAT program, and they fall off of it by, you know, having access to illicit drugs, buying drugs, now they're using, and now they're tested and they come up positive. Um, obviously, we have a disciplinary process that we would follow um, as far as punitive damages for them being on drugs or whatever the case may be. But are they then taken off because they just relapsed? Because, I mean, it happens in the street all the time. Somebody's on a program and then, you know, hey, I messed up. And, you know, we don't necessarily tell them, hey, we're going to stop you from doing an MAT program. How does it help or how does it work in this instance? So, I mean, really it is about reassessing, right? Like, you look to see, like, what, what, what did this person actually take? What was the relapse? And you try to figure out, is there something in the treatment process? Initially, that's what we look at. Is there something in the treatment process that we missed that didn't address this particular inmate's need? If there was something we missed, then we go back and try to look at what is our policy and procedure and how do we miss this thing? And so we don't automatically jump to a, you are disqualified from being a part of the program because you've relapsed. We first look at what is it that we're doing and how did we miss something? Then we'll go back and look at, well, what are all the other circumstances surrounding the relapse? You know, um, many times you have like the inmates got a letter or they got, they had a call and the phone call didn't go well. Something happened with, you know, one of their children and they heard about it and it sent them down a path that they wouldn't have normally taken. And so the psychiatrists and like the mental, other mental health providers are really going to look to stabilize that person mentally and then reassess whether or not MAT is appropriate for that person. So we as medical don't typically get involved in the punitive side of things. I think that really comes in when you look at what is the criteria for being a part of MAT. And if the criteria established, which you've now gotten buy-in from all the stakeholders, right? So you typically would have medical, mental health, and custody a part of establishing that criteria. Of course, there'll be a medical side because there are certain things medically that have to be followed in order for someone to be a part of a program. But I think in creating that criteria, it's looking at what are the security concerns that are raised and are there ways for us to mitigate some of those concerns with this criteria we're establishing? So are there consequences for not showing up? 
medical will typically say we're not a part of the consequences. We're not here for the punitive side of corrections. We're here to provide medical care, mm -hmm. you know. But if there is something that comes up that I think should be of a concern, like so if you guys come and say, oh, well, you know, we noticed that, you know, this guy was coming to get his meds, but, you know, he was, uh, he sells it or, you know, he's somehow involved in something illicit on the backside. We might not be aware of that, but if it is the next step that says he can no longer participate because he's clearly not in need of it, medical is fine with removing them. Let, let me ask, I don't know, hopefully this question makes sense, but where's the greater risk? The potential for the relapse or the withdrawal? I would say with the withdrawal. I mean, so so you know that the relapse, is, there's a possibility, right? And we can't really control if this person is going to overdose, like what they're doing that is in that relapse space, right? But when they're going through the detox between the chills and the shivers and all the physiological things that are going on with the body, sometimes it's very hard to bounce back. And so if you've ever seen someone going through detox and there hasn't been a med medical intervention, that person could die from that. So, from, the, from the withdrawal? Yeah. Now we've seen some cases yeah. that, that happens that, you know, dehydration is the biggest one. Yes. Because of, you know, going through that re detoxing. Um, you know, if they're not medically seen, and, and, and uh, you can see that those those are physical signs. A person yeah. can't get up out of bed, can't walk, can't 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 function. Your brain starts shutting down, and your system starts shutting down because of that um, detox. And so I wholeheartedly say this is something that's necessary at that initial stage when you are in jail and you're coming off the street and you may be addicted to any type of drug, obviously, and and, and it works well there. Um, sometimes you hear that. that it's just to repercussions or anything that hesitation once they get into prison because you figure that they've gone through that aspect but like Connie just explained so now they've gone through the the real methods of getting onto the MAT system or the program because they were seen in a jail setting now they might have been sentenced now we know they're going to be with us for a long period of time um, five years ten years right. whatever your sentence is so you know, line staff will always be looking, well, you know, their thought is we're replacing the drug with another drug. You know, now we're becoming the suppliers of the drug. And that's where the mentality comes in that, oh, are, are we the drug dealers now that the, the person, but they don't understand the, the connection where we're not being the supplier. We're just trying to be the assistance or help or aid in removing them from that addiction that they have. Right, and that's where that cross perspective understanding of what medical is trying to accomplish and what custody and again guys i think the common solution now is just the open communication that i don't feel we have and it was funny because we touched on that before between custody and just overall civilian staff and we've actually uh did a video together on medical and custody communication and then like you mentioned before how some may feel that they're above and then maybe custody may feel that they feel that they're below and you know a whole, a whole string of, of concerns one last thing before we talk about re-entry what are, what are some of the conflicts when you try to initiate a uh, MAT program inside a prison or a jail? Like from a medical perspective, so you're trying to initiate the program, what are some of the uh, kickbacks you get uh, in regards to starting the program fresh? Outside of the safety and security concerns, maybe something more on an administrative level. Well, I mean, I think for us, initially trying to start the program was where would we do it from, right? So like you've got your normal med window, which you have all of your regular meds set up there, but because, you know, most of the MATs, as far as I know, are all controlled substances, you have to have that room locked. There's like a whole process around securing those meds so that no one can gain access to it and that there's no way that meds could be diverted. Um, making sure that wherever that is, that nurse is safe because people want the meds. Like, that's that's just a fact, right? Um, so aside from just regular safety and security, once they've gotten the meds, just how do we make sure that the nurse is okay, right? And also, I think for us, it's, we think about 
the issue of addiction and we usually assume that our employees don't have a problem with addiction, right? So we have to be mindful of who's selected to be that person wow. who's mm -hmm. under, who will have the lock and key to the narcotics. Well, you know, it's funny, we never ever discussed that on the last episode, but you're right, the person that is uh, handing out the meds, yes. is that a problem? Do you find that sometimes that type of medication no, is I, I personally had that problem in the facility I supervised, wow. where we actually terminated the nurse. We walked her out. And it turned out, I mean, she had an addiction history, which they usually say most addiction counselors are the best counselors because they've had some personal experience with the issue. And it turned out she wasn't necessarily diverting the meds for herself, but there were, you know, like when you might miss one pill here and there, it wasn't like you're missing something significant. I mean, and because it's a narcotic, you've got the DEA who's showing up at the facility. The warden is like, what and what is going on here? Like a lot happens when you've got things like that going on. So from the medical side, I mean, I think we don't typically talk about things like that, which is you've got to make sure that whoever you're trusting to be that nurse, to provide those meds that that nurse can truly be trusted. And, and the fact that we mentioned, guys, we're going to touch on another topic, and I'll, again, I'll, I'll start with you, and then I'll, I'll, you're going to have to intervene on this, mm -hmm. but keeping track of the supply that's given to medical. Yes. What are the some of the best known practices in keeping track of the supply, both from a medical perspective, and then obviously how would that interact with custody? What would you, are you guys expected to keep track of it as well? So there's a count that goes on multiple, there are multiple points of security for that. When it leaves the, so we had a central pharmacy that delivered it to the facilities. So central pharmacy had a count and a sheet that they have to report on. When we get it, we have to count and verify, but two people do it to make sure that that med has been accounted for. And then at the point at which the nurse who's going to be doing um, medline for the narcotic, there's another count that happens. So there's like multiple counts each time to make sure that we always know that we have the right number. Well, you know, in most correctional facilities throughout the United States, including here, um, we all follow ACA guidelines, um, of which I'm a member of, as you know. Um, and one of those guidelines that they have and during your audits, we learned this, is that we have to account for not only narcotics, we also have to account for the sharks. So if some of these uh, MATs may come in in, in a shot form or a yeah. syringe form, there's always a level of accountability. Where it's coming from, it arrives at the institution, it's counted, like Connie said, by two individuals. Um, most places have not only medical counting, but also the custody counting, and we both sign off. And then at time of disbursement, again, once a shift or once uh, uh, during the week, there is a, an actual count again done, verifying that, yeah, with the dosages that were dispensed are matching with the dosages that are left. Um, most places do it on a daily basis, so, on a shift basis. So when we're doing the count, who's doing the count? Um, it depends. The, the, the facility will always put in and institute their policy, but in most cases that I've found in facilities that I've worked at is always a supervisor doing a, let's say, a weekly count, um, but a daily count is always by a corrections officer along with the medical, whether it be the nurse uh, that's coming on duty or the, and the nurse leaving. So it's always in conjunction. So in case something comes up, hey, there's a dosage missing or there's a pill missing, where where is the... Uh, you know, where, where's the problem? We right. have to and, resolve it at that time. And it's great because it could be addressed immediately. Correct. Yeah. All right, so before we go into closing, I also want to touch on re-entry because obviously that is a big part of the, I'm assuming that's a big part of the program, yes. correct? So we're looking at basically when someone's getting ready to leave the facility, how was the program continued, and what are the concerns? You know, basically, and I think that deals with communication, that's transitioning. Are we losing a piece of that communication when the inmate starts to go out to the community? So... I think when, when they're in the facility, they're a captive audience, right? Like, that's the reality. We, if they don't show up and they don't make that good decision in that moment to go, they know it's 2 o'clock, that's your med line, go get your meds, right? At least you have someone who's going to prompt them. You have a nurse, you've got a doctor, you've got someone who's going to call a union to figure out what's going on. And, of course, the challenge is this person is now going out into the community 
how will they remain stable in the community? I mean, yeah, we can reach out to, we typically will set up like through the discharge planning process or the reentry counselors, they will set up a way for them to have access once they get into the community. But of course, it's the challenge of, you know, medical insurance. Are, the, are those things in place by the time they're ready to go out? Sometimes they are and sometimes they aren't. And it's one thing to say, well, we can give a prescription, but who's going to fill that prescription, right? Without there being some way to comp to pay for that prescription being filled. Um, there are different programs in the community that some support and some don't support it. Some have the resources to be able to send, you know, their workers out with the in or for the offender to go get, you know, the methadone or the suboxone but that's that's like kind of the ideal situation and that's really not the reality each time someone goes out into the community so there's always that how do we make sure there's a continuity of care once that person is released and we we really don't have a way to do that so you think that out of what we discussed about the program mm -hmm. you think this is the biggest need that still has yet to be addressed yes well now obviously being involved in Reentry. Um, what are some of the concerns you see from the other, and now you're getting these inmates that may be on MAT? Well, that's the, uh, the the challenge that we have. I mean, we know that whether they're in prison or they were in, in a reentry program uh, after prison, um, we all work with a budget, right? We all with, have to work within that budget. So the same um, issues and concerns that they have while in prison that, you know, what can I put them on? How much money is there in that budget set aside for an MAT program? Is there money set aside for the follow-up after they get released? Um, now you're coming to a re-entry facility that works under contracts on their budgets as well. Do we have their medical uh, set up so that the medication can be paid for, can medication can be covered, or does that re-entry facility have to fit the bill for that and, and maybe they're going to a lesser type of MAT that now we're not looking at the person's uh, best health or best interest as opposed to oh I gotta work within this budget so those are the challenges as well and then making those contacts with those outside sources that once they leave us you know are they gonna get the help they need while they're out who's supplying them so like if you do, let's say the program does have a successful transition and let's say they either make it to a residential release, uh, more so the residential release, let's just deal with that. Who would supply the inmate with the Suboxone? We're not going to keep it on their person, correct? So who supplies it to them at that time? I mean, I know that there are clinics that they're able to go into and, and get that sort of treatment and follow up, but um, I don't think that... So I've gone to a few like halfway houses. Some places have um, like a clinic room. It's like a really comp like a small space that really isn't secure. They do minimal. I mean, really, if there's an emergency situation or maybe, you know, someone needs a Tylenol, but like something as significant as methadone or Suboxone, I honestly don't know that that capacity is built into a lot of these outside agencies. Well, speaking in general, and again, non-specific, of course, what would be some of the recommendations you would have from a safety and security side of things? Where would you figure would be the, obviously we don't want the offender or the inmate, I, I, the resident, let's just say the resident, uh, having it on their person. So how would a residential release program, and again, non-specific, just an idea, just in general, be able to continue to supply that individual with what's requested? Well, unless they have a medical department in their facility or mm -hmm. a, a small clinic, it, it becomes a very hard thing to continue. That, that's the big, that's, that's the, gotta be one of the big bridges, right, that we just haven't mm -hmm. been able to build? Correct. So, I mean, if any type of correctional setting is sending someone out to the facility and they're under an MAT program, they have to factor that in, that will they be serviced correctly at that halfway house or at that program? Um, are the facilities capable of continuing the care? And if they're not, then they should think twice before sending them there you know, or find other ways or other means to, you know, have that transition into uh, I'm sure, civilian life. I'm sure people probably thought about this, but would one of the means be that that facility drives them back to the institution? That can happen, but it, always there's a cost within your budget. 
You know, how many times do I have to take them back to the facility? Is it a daily thing? Is it, an, uh, you know, twice a week? Um, that would be more logistics than anything else. And then I would be the one asking the questions as, as, a, as a manager. Okay, well, who's going to fit the bill? And can we just go for a cheap or can we just put them on a 30-day shot as opposed to the Suboxone, which mm. is administered daily, you know? Now you're now talking it's, numbers. It's more than just the drug that they need. Now you're talking about the travel to get there. Logistics, and, transportation. And at that point, yes. If, Who's doing it? Are we doing it? And it's also when they come back into the facility, because that was one of the issues that we faced, that we had women coming back into the facility. They were dressed in plain clothes. I mean, they went through the, sh the intake process and were searched. But is there a contraband concern that we need to have because they're coming back into facility and then now in like plain clothes and there's like all this other stuff that kind of it opens the door to because they're coming back for meds they're technically free right. right but then old habits die hard I guess all right so obviously I think this was a great discussion again it is a discussion that we revisited we have done it before we had Russ Hamilton on with us last time but I thought there was a lot more that we could explore and I thought we actually uh, did uh, cover a lot of new uh, territory obviously we revisited some of the old but we definitely covered a lot of the new that we didn't get a chance to last time. I'm still not done with this conversation, guys. I still feel I may want to discuss, and hopefully Kanye and, your, and uh, uh, Lou, if you're willing to come on with me next time, I still want to discuss juveniles and MAT. I think it's something that we could explore uh, that hasn't been done. But guys, in closing, do you have anything you want to say to my audience, Lou? Well, I think that uh, we've covered a lot. We've... Uh Basically, dove in. We dove in. I know, you're giving me your notes. We dove in into something uh, that's very new, very positive, I think. Um, I do want to reiterate that communication is the key. Um, my line staff, the custodial side of it all, uh, needs to buy in into the entire program in order to make it effective and make it work. Um, we always talk about corrections being part of rehabilitation being part of corrections and I think that the more we move towards that um, we can bridge the gap between corrections and medical and getting that communication that's necessary in order to get these programs to work. Um, understanding on the correctional aspect side, on the line staff side, the importance and how well it'll keep us safer in our institutions by having programs such as this one um, where a person that who's been addicted to drugs all their life uh, has now not just going cold turkey and not right. being able to uh, satisfy those cravings that they have, but do it in a positive way where they feel supported by a medical staff and feel supported by the custodi custodial staff by making sure that this program works well. And what's your thoughts, Connie? So for me, it really is that aside from, I think, the communication, I think it's just the understanding that both medical and custody were working in the same hazardous environment, right? We're dealing with the same population, and our reality is that this program does help. Does it fix everything? No, it doesn't. I think medical has to be aware of the safety and security concerns that are raised, but I think it's also custody having the understanding that medical is there to do a job, right? And part of that job is making sure that the offenders are stable. They're providing adequate health care to this population. And that includes this MAT program that's being brought into many of the facilities now. And it's not until we come together and we have these very tough discussions that we can see both sides of the story and do our best to come to a happy medium, essentially, because ultimately the addiction problem isn't going away. It's only getting worse. I got to tell you, a happy medium makes administration very happy. You know, and, uh, before I go into closing, I just want to mention, too, I'm going to kind of comment on what you guys said, but there is an importance of communication. We don't work in an isolated manner. We have to get the mission done. And as you start to move up and you start to see the different parts, you also realize that all the parts are working together. Uh, to complete that same mission, like both of you guys said, the rehabilitation aspect. So it's great for us to be aware of those components, even at a front line, because as, even as we decide to move up, we may realize at, at a front line how these parts need to interact with each other, which only can make us better managers. Uh, and I agree. I was always curious about what the other departments were doing and who to know that eventually in my career, I'd be moving up and be supervising these other departments. So it's great to see it at the front line because you'll never, you never know when you could wind up supervising a department that you 
tend to thought you were isolated from, and, and there is no isolation in corrections. We work together as one, and I think if the inmates see that we're working together as one, we become less vulnerable. Uh, they, they can't divide, and I hate that divide between custody and civilian. I wish it didn't exist. Also, I would like to thank people that helped us organize this event. So first off, again, thank you, uh, Lou and, and Connie, for coming out. Also like to thank you guys. Can't see her, but she's in the back there somewhere. Helena Tomei, she's on the executive board with us on the New Jersey American Correctional Association. If you guys aren't aware, the New Jersey American Correctional Association, I've been with them for a few years now on the executive board. I sit there with a few of us, obviously, uh, Louis Soto and Helena Tomei, who's in the background. Um, they, they help us a lot with, with training, recognition, awareness, just topics that we feel need to be addressed. But it's very important to also remember that they're trying to get the front line involved in part of the evolution of corrections, of where we're going. I think a lot of us feel that front line's being left out, and I think the NJACA is a big supporter in bringing that front line to the table and having them involved in discussions like this. And that's why it was important that they put their name on um, a dialogue, uh, including uh, obviously medical assisted treatment, along with many other dialogues that we're gonna have in the near future. I would also like to thank American Military University. Those are my people, they've been with me since day one. So thank you for helping me spread my message, even if it's just me sitting in the car, talking about nothing. You guys have always been there for me because not only do you believe in me, but more importantly, you believe in the profession. And also, a, a new sponsor, a little bit. If you, can you just explain exactly what Civilians Corrections Academy is? Sure, so Civilian Corrections Academy pretty much looks at how do we practically operate as civilians in corrections. I think oftentimes there are all these you know, rules and there's you know, you can't do this, you can't do that. And I think a lot of things get lost in translation for civilians. So what I've created was a curriculum to help civilians to really understand what the expectations are as they walk into a correctional environment and what the realities are. And guys, as you can see, the guests I bring on my show, they're not myopic, they're very well versed. So obviously your training has got to be great because you actually understand our perspective. And that's why we're able to have a conversation like this because also... Uh, Louis Soto here understands the other perspective, and I think that's a big part of why we're able to have the dialogue. It is that middle ground. So, guys, if you happen to show Tear Talks for you, brave men and women that work in corrections, so please subscribe, interact, engage, comment, hit that bell. That bell is going to notify you every time I post a video. Tear Talk out. Ooh. <laughs>